Module 11 Relational Summary Lecture GWP1, The West and the Quest for Utopia. Let's face it, the politics of the West should really be considered the politics of those people who are enslaved and exterminated by those following the politics of the global north. We're talking West Africans torn from their villages and towns and chained in the bowels of slave ships bound further west. Native Americans north and south whose ways of life and extensive trade routes were destroyed by the conquistadors and the cowboys, the pilgrims and the Jesuits. The politics of the West that we want to study are really those of what were to European minds new worlds as they wandered and plundered south and west. Perhaps you're aware that most of the political, economic, social, religious, and ecological observations of the Aztecs and the Maya and the Inca people were well documented in their extensive codices and were made available to the world, but that the Spanish conquistadors deliberately burned and destroyed them. The conquering army's reasoning was simple. If what the libraries of the indigenous civilizations had to say was in any way valuable, then it should already have been found in the Bible and so wasn't worth saving. And if it wasn't in the Bible, then it was probably of the devil and needed to be destroyed. Such was the political logic of the North at that time. So we don't have an awful lot to go on. Some of indigenous Western political philosophy still made it into our politics of the North, of course. The politician and statesman Sir Thomas More wrote his famous 1516 book, Utopia, based on reports from explorers to the New World, whose practices he fictionalized but used to critique the policies of the monarchy he served in didn't stop him from getting beheaded by King Henry VIII, the butcher king he was once advisor to. Apparently, the politics of the West, which Moore found resonant with his Catholic and humanist ideals, were considered treasonous by the bloody monarch of the North and his bloody Mary bride. The political ideas of the West also directly and deliberately made it into our own American constitution used to fight against the tyranny of English kings like Henry. A great PBS documentary entitled How the Iroquois Great Law of Peace Shaped U.S. Democracy details how this happened. It says, quote, the Iroquois Confederacy, founded by the great peacemaker in 1142, is the oldest living participatory democracy on earth. In 1988, the U.S. Senate paid tribute with a resolution that said, quote, the confederation of the original 13 colonies into one republic was influenced by the political system developed by the Iroquois Confederacy, as were many of the democratic principles which were incorporated into the, into the Constitution itself." End quote. And yet, we don't talk much about the great peacemakers. You probably only know Hiawatha, who organized the Native American Constitution as a little cartoon boy in one of Disney's silly symphonies. But if anybody belongs up there on Mount Rushmore, it would be him. Quote, Benjamin Franklin referenced the Iroquois model as he presented his plan of union at the Albany Congress in 1754, attended by representatives of the Iroquois and the seven colonies. He invited the great council members of the Iroquois to address the Continental Congress in 1776, end quote. We owe the slogan E Pluribus Unum over the symbol of the American Eagle and the Great Seal of the United States that's on our dollar bills to the way Hiawatha, quote, united the five nations into a league of nations, or the Iroquois Confederacy, and became the basis for the Iroquois Confederacy Constitution, end quote. And the eagle, clutching the arrows at the bottom of the symbol, is a direct reference to another great politician leader of the West. Quote, in 1744, the Onondaga leader Kanasatego gave a speech urging the contentious 13 colonies to unite as the Iroquois had at the signing of the Treaty of Lancaster. This cultural exchange inspired the English colonist Benjamin Franklin to print Canisatego's speech. Quote, we heartily recommend union and a good agreement between you, our brethren, Canastego had said. Never disagree, but preserve a strict friendship for one another, and thereby you, as well as we, will become the stronger. Our wise forefathers established union and amity between the five nations. This has made us formidable. This has given us great weight and authority with our neighboring nations. We are a powerful confederacy, and by your observing the same methods our wise forefathers have taken, you will acquire fresh strength and power. Therefore, whatever befalls you, never fall out with one another." End quote. He used a metaphor that many arrows cannot be broken as easily as one, 
and this is what inspired the bundle of 13 arrows held by an eagle in the Great Seal of the United States. Now how's that for a sustainable politics of the West? Perhaps what is most inspiring for those of us studying sustainability and fighting climate disruption is how the politics of the West spoke in terms that today are the epitome of what we mean by sustainability. Says PBS, quote, the Native American model of governance that is fair and will always meet the needs of the seventh generation to come is taken from the Iroquois Confederacy. The seventh generation principle dictates that decisions that are made today should lead to sustainability for seven generations into the future. And indigenous nations in North America were and are for the most part organized by democratic principles that focus on the creation of strong kinship bonds that promote leadership in which honor is not earned by material gain but by service to others. In the plains there was great honor in giving your horses to the poorest members of the tribe. The potlatch still practiced in the Pacific Northwest is another example of voluntarily redistributing wealth to those who have the least." End quote. Of course, these ideas are an anathema to those who prefer oligarchy and the slim possibility of trickle-down economics to the social safety net aspects of representative democracy. Our indigenous political traditions had a concept of environmental justice that suggests a great need for a Green New Deal today. A deal that questions the value of fracking and seeks to end the filthy extraction of an inefficient combustion of fossil fuels, knowing that drawdown savings guarantee a positive, not negative, economic impact. The only negative is the amount of carbon that will be in the air. You have to ask yourself, what if? What if the initial cooperation between our nation's founding fathers and the treaties they made with the indigenous political leaders of the West had been honored? What if instead of the Trail of Tears, we had included the people who were here when we arrived from the East in an even broader democracy? What if we had become members of the Confederacy and everyone had a voice? I mean the Iroquois Confederacy, not the Confederate Army here. Could sustainability have simply survived so that we wouldn't need classes like this? Could we have together created an advanced technological civilization without blundering into climate change? I think so. Since most of the clean technologies we use to fight climate change today, solar cells, fuel cells, efficient hydro and wind turbines, sterling engines, electric cars, etc., etc., were being discovered and developed by scientists from the late 1700s until the early 1900s, the era when Native Americans were still fighting for their rights and signing treaties for the hopeful cooperation that Hiawatha and Conestatego spoke so eloquently about, it is very well possible that we would have bypassed fossil fuels altogether and implemented clean energy solutions over a century ago. After all, the French chemist Lavoisier, around the time of the French Revolution for Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, in the 1780s, was experimenting with lenses to create solar heliostats to power his experiments because he declared oil and its derivatives too unhealthy and dangerous to work with. So it isn't as though we didn't know. It's just that the barbaric imperialists and politicians of the East the European kings and queens, didn't respect or understand science and had no intention of listening to the scientists like Lavoisier. Sounds a lot like what we're going through today, doesn't it? As a college freshman on the prowl for knowledge in the basement of the Harvard used bookstore in 1980, just after Reagan had been elected president and taken the solar panels off the White House that Jimmy Carter had put there to symbolize our repudiation of oil and nuclear power, just after I had finished reading Orwell's chilling 1984, which was the year I was stated to, slated to graduate, worried that we might ignore the science I was learning in college and slide into a militarized tyranny of our own, even as we said we were in the good fight against the Soviet communists, I stumbled upon a worn copy of Who's the Savage? The Documentary History of the Mistreatment of the Native North Americans, the 1973 classic collection of essays edited by David Drone. And Russell Nelson. It had come out when I was 11, around the time when I was first becoming interested in Native American history and the current violations of their rights, brought to my attention by a slew of Billy Jack films that explored the Kent State massacres of student protesters at the time of the Vietnam War and showed how these injustices against well-intentioned white kids were just the tip of the iceberg when it came to our authoritarian brutality 
and that the real violence was always being perpetrated against Native American and Black and Brown Americans, protesting not just to stay out of the draft, but to have the rights and freedoms here at home that we were supposedly being forced to go overseas to fight for. Each essay in the book was another jaw-dropper for kids who had grown up comfortable in the suburbs and had never really questioned the narratives that we grew up on watching John Wayne kill Native Americans with utter impunity in all those Westerns. But it was more than that. If you were raised in a progressive Christian household, you probably agreed that slaughtering Indians and sending them to reservations was cruelty and evil personified. But in our high school debate classes, we still would argue that overall the post-enlightenment Western expansion and the work of missionaries and teachers was probably on balance a good thing, given that the peoples we encountered as we radiated out to the south and west of the prime meridian were primitive. We never questioned the labeling. They didn't wear tailored clothing, and they preferred to walk around with no shirt and no shoes, so they definitely couldn't go into any of the fancy restaurants that we went to, right? They didn't speak English, so they must not be educated, and most of them didn't domesticate or control other animals, and others didn't even practice agriculture. Didn't we all know from school that agriculture was what created civilization in the first place? How could hunter-gatherers be civilized? Of course, it wasn't until the 1980s when I was at Harvard that, I, that scholars began to uncover and present evidence that you didn't need agriculture to build a city or civilization at all. We learned in cultural anthropology my sophomore year that right around where I grew up in the land of Lincoln and throughout St. Louis, where my father went to a Jesuit college, there were these, the remains of these massive mound cities where Native Americans lived and traded and engaged in the politics of inclusion more often than not. Of course, we were cautioned that all peoples can act horribly to one another. Biological anthropology class taught us that there was nothing in the genes of the people of the New World that made them any better at good politics or environmental stewardship than the people of the Old World. But despite all the tales of terror, of tribal warfare and cruel practices, of sacrifices on top of Tikal and Chichen Itza, of cannibalism in the Amazon, it became obvious from cross-cultural comparison that the savagery of the New World couldn't in any way compare with what, had been, what we had been doing and still were doing throughout the westward expansion. The enterprise of imperialism and colonialism and slavery and extractive economy, propelled by a rhetoric of zealous manifest destiny, fostered and justified more savagery by the Europeans than any peoples we encountered everywhere. And the one thing that ethnography had proven was that not only are we all endowed by our creator with the same intelligence and capacity for high culture, but with the inalienable rights supposedly guaranteed by our American constitution, a constitution that grew out of an e pluribus unum of the English Magna Carta and the Iroquois Confederate Constitution. Politics is actually a very good thing, that is, when people, the polity, sit down to discuss ideas and try to work out fair compromises. Politics controlled by violent powers hell-bent on profit through exploitation, whether of ecosystem services, natural capital, or of animal labor and human capital and labor, always seem to devolve into an unsustainable and tragic mess. Okay, so you're probably wondering how to connect all this with climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. So let's look at what has happened to politics here in the West in contemporary times. Right now, we're in a curious and jumbled moment in history when false dichotomies are being used to obscure the real issues surrounding climate drawdown solutions. De Tocqueville, at the founding of our democracy, you may remember, warned against the tyranny of the majority, suggesting that strict adherence to what we call ancient Athenian democracy, where every citizen has an equal vote, could lead to mob rule if the majority turn out to be poorly educated or informed. To protect against this, the new nation of America created a republic ruled by a representative democracy where elected leaders vetted by their understanding of and adherence to and dedication to the Constitution, assumedly men and women of letters, well enough educated to do a deep read of the document, would ensure that the needs of the people were met without violating the intent and spirit of the Constitution. This was the notion of a republic. 
and it even involved creating an electoral college, college to help balance out what might become unfair population biases. Now, for the last four years, we've seen a typical populist revolt where many people who felt marginalized by the growing lack of opportunities for citizens without advanced degrees or political connections were systematically told that climate change due to anthropogenic global warming, the greatest existential threat to civilization as we know it and to ecology as we knew it, was variably a Chinese hoax or an exaggeration or had nothing to do with humans or was out of our control anyway, so the best course of action is to ignore it and continue business as usual. The scare tactic used was that any rapid movement to an economy not based on fossil fuels and rampant cradle-to-grave consumption would take huge bites out of their already dwindling income through either higher taxes or higher prices or both. Forget for a moment that more sober analyses of the transition to a circular economy actually show the reverse, because the hallmark of populist revolts is that they're anything but nuanced. The scare tactic has worked, because people are by and large conservative and overall slower to change what mother culture has taught them is normal and traditional, and therefore good. Without leadership, modeling how to have a constructive dialogue that can create an unum from the e pluribus it's hard for the body politic to work together in a coherent body. Where the Iroquois had traditions of honoring elders' wisdom and planning for the seventh generation, the new politics of the so-called capitalist West plans only for the end of the quarter, seeking annual, if not quarterly, profits ever rising, while the communist blocs talk in terms of five-year plans. Almost nobody except indigenous politicians and sustainability students talk about 200-year plans. So ironically, the climate is changing faster than the politics that can mitigate it or adapt to it. And the biggest irony is that we've created the illusion that by amplifying the voices of climate skeptics, we're somehow actually engaging in a more complete politics of inclusion. This last point shouldn't be lost on you. When you watch climate debates, you will see that at its best, the media is obsessed with giving equal time to both sides, even when one side is provably false. Opinion competes with science and is given equal or greater weight. Sadly, that isn't how the rules of debate work, and it isn't how representative democracies are supposed to work. Plato in his Republic, one of the first coherent treatises written about the possibilities of achieving some kind of utopia, wrote in 375 BC these cautionary words, words that toll with gravity today. He wrote, Democracy is a charming form of government, full of variety and disorder, and dispensing a sort of equality to equals and unequals alike. But whatever deceives men seems to produce a magical enchantment. And he wrote, those who tell the stories rule society. He cautioned that wise men speak because they have something to say, fools because they have to say something. But he championed inclusion and cooperation and the idea that we need each voice to complete the story, saying, quote, Every heart sings a song, incomplete, until another heart whispers back. Those who wish to sing always find a song. He pointed out that, quote, human behavior flows from three main sources, desire, emotion, and knowledge, saying, there are three classes of men, lovers of wisdom, lovers of honor, and lovers of gain. And he felt that we could all become lovers of wisdom and honor if we practiced, stating, quote, excellence is not a gift, but a skill that takes practice. We do not act rightly because we are excellent. In fact, we achieve excellence by acting rightly. Because, he said, ignorance is the root and stem of every evil. But, he said, books are immortal sons defying their sires. And he believed in the integration of art and science and emphasized that, quote, music gives a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and life to everything. And finally, he counseled against getting too comfortable and indolent, stressing that necessity is the mother of invention. Yes, that is where that famous saying came from. The tricky part of that is that we can't wait so long that the necessity becomes so urgent and the life, that the life support system has been so compromised that we can't invent our way out of this mess. As Martin Luther King said so eloquently, if we do not act now, we will be dragged into a time reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. 
The tricky part of this politics is that more strict criteria for inclusion based on formalized education have been used to keep people with real knowledge about how to combat climate change out of the dialogue. The indigenous peoples of the world are treasure troves of sustainability information, but very, very, very few have had the opportunity to attend college or get credentials or degrees that are respected in the New West. For this reason, as Robert Schiffman points out in Lessons Learned from Centuries of Indigenous Forest Management, published on August 20th of 2018 at the Yale School of the Environment, quote, we've learned basically nothing from them, indigenous people, because we don't even see that they have any useful information, but that is totally incorrect. So on the one hand, we have a complete mistrust of the elites, of the rule of experts, with one side questioning scientists and believing that the statements of truck drivers and real estate moguls should carry as much weight as ecologists and, and climate specialists. And on the other hand, we have a complete dismissal of marginalized individuals and populations who have lived experience with other forms of land management and subsistence. Unfortunately, we're in a bit of a bind because we created institutions that emphasize pedigree and position and institutions and credentials and degrees over demonstration of competency. Assessing the qualifications for somebody to weigh in on a vital matter is becoming harder and harder, especially when you have a president who says, well, let me quote the, the, the Washington Post. Let me get this right. President Trump, quote, has for years cited the genes he shares with his uncle to try to demonstrate that he too has a scientific in intellect, an effort that he has stressed while dealing with the coronavirus. Quote, I really get it, the president said March 6th about benefiting from his bloodline as he discussed the coronavirus at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He said, maybe I should have done that instead of running for president. During his campaign, he told CNN, quote, I had an uncle who went to MIT who's a top professor, Dr. John Trump, a genius. It's in my blood. I'm smart. He told the Boston Globe that he and his uncle have very good genetics. But at the same time, in his debate with Vice President Biden, he criticized where, he went, where the vice president went to college and said, quote, you graduated either the lowest or almost the lowest in your class. Don't ever use the word smart with me. Don't ever use that word. So this is a kind of politics of bullying and intimidation and newspeak where the argument and the standards seem to change like the wind. But ultimately, it is very clear that there is one core logic subtending and undergirding the entire political moment. And it's the same one that created the idea of manifest destiny and led to the Europeans' westward expansion, eugenics. The belief that some clans' genes are better and more worthy than in others. Ultimately, as Robert Bullard, the African-American father of the environmental justice movement, pointed out decades ago, all pollution and environmental degradation up to and including climate change are issues of injustice being politically and socioeconomically forced onto those without power, and particularly onto those who are exploited by colonialism and imperialism. It often seems that no matter what they say, no matter how much experience or wisdom they have, no matter how many degrees from their conquerors and enslavers and exploiters education systems they get, the leavers will never have much influence on the takers, and the takers will empower their own mobs no matter how poorly educated or inexperienced, as long as they parrot the taker mantras. For this reason, above all others, the politics of the West has become the same politics as that of the global North, and shows little chance of making the necessary changes. Unless, and yet, there is hope from the far West, where West and East are blending. California, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, and Polynesia, right up to the anti-meridian. In these intensely hybrid spaces, the farthest away from Greenwich, England's prime meridian and the countries along the line that towed the line for spreading the extractive mindset, experiments are being done that resonate with their multicultural, multi-ethnic populations. We began to observe it in the 1980s when Ernest Kallenbach published some of this generation's best utopian literature in his books Ecotopia and Ecotopia Emerging. The premise of these books was that after a high school girl in California successfully creates a highly efficient do-it-yourself solar cell out of materials that anybody can find, 
a groundswell community empowerment movement of people whose politics align with sustainability principles eventually leads Northern California, Oregon, and Washington to secede from the rest of the United States to form an ecotopia. What is interesting about the premise is that while the West Coast has been referred to as the left coast, the kind of people who make up ecotopia are not depicted as stereotype liberals in any sense. In fact, there are as many libertarians and conservatives among the group of secessionists. What seems to bind them together is the realization that they don't need to be dependent on either big government or big business to provide their own food, energy, water, or shelter. And it is this common cause in a landscape of extreme diversity observing Plato's rule that necessity is the mother of invention that leads them to overcome their differences and create the unum out of the pluribus. We have some great political drawdown solutions to apply right now. One is indigenous people's land management, solution number 39, which we'll also talk about in other modules, protecting 849.37 gigatons of existing sequestered carbon and drawing down an additional 6.19 gigatons at basically no cost to the hegemonic economy at all, since the indigenous people are already living in a drawdown and carbon protective way. So no investment is needed other than giving them their rights. Another is solution number 38, forest protection, keeping 896.29 gigatons sequestered in the forests and drawing down 6.2 gigatons and not costing anything is politically difficult because land speculators and profiteers have their eyes on those trees and that land for future profit. And then there's a bridge solution that comes in at number 34, reducing CO2 by 7.5 by gigatons at a net cost of $402.3 billion and a net savings of $519.4 billion, but this one is rather complex, it's biomass. With the prevailing political order, our book says that biomass can be either friend or foe, because it, quote, trades in carbon already in circulation and only works so long as use and replenishment remain in balance. They say there is an if. Biomass energy is a viable solution if it uses appropriate feedstock, such as waste products or sustainably grown appropriate energy crops. Optimally, it also uses a low emission conversion technology, such as gasification or digestion. Using annual grain crops, such as corn and sorghum for energy production, depletes groundwater, causes erosion, and requires high inputs of energy in the form of fertilizer and equipment operation. The sustainable alternative is perennial crops, or so-called short-rotation woody crops. Perennial herbaceous grasses, such as switchgrass and miscanthus, which can be harvested for over 15 years before replanting, becomes necessary. And they require fewer inputs of water and labor. Woody crops such as shrub willow, eucalyptus and poplar and paulonia are able to grow on marginal land not suited to food production. Because they grow back after being cut close to the ground, they can be harvested repeatedly for 10 to 20 years. These woody crops circumvent the deforestation that comes with using forests as fuel and sequester carbon more rapidly than most other trees can, but not if they replace already forested land. Care needs to be taken with both miscanthus and eucalyptus, however, as they're invasive, end quote. But the controversial elements of biomass they speak about, the constructed debates about forests versus fuel and fur food versus fuel, are actually red herrings. Our book points out that managing land, cultivating food, and producing biomass feedstock interact dynamically, and the three can be mutually reinforcing, or, play, or they can play out to one another's detriment. So how biomass feedstocks are approached within a given local context, context matters enormously." End quote. And this is where local and indigenous politics offer the solution. Because if you allow for the voices of the people of the forest, of people who live in and depend on forests, not those who profit from individual plantation trees as commodities. And if you include all those voices and give support to their education and inventiveness, the necessity for creating long-term forest level solutions that last as long as the oldest trees, seven generations, rather than solutions that last only as long as one season harvest for the quarterly report, then forests will never burn out of control as we see happening now in the West because they'll be managed by the people who lived among and love and respect the trees. Then and only then can the scientific forest management principles of Germany, back east, and the cultural forest management practices of the Native Americans of the West merge to bring back that most salient feature of the ecology of the world, the forests that always sustained us. 
In effect, it is the true American dream, the synthesis of the best of the West and the best of the East, the best of the North and the best of the South, coming together in a nexus forest, providing all the food, energy, water, and zero waste nexus amenities, and liberty and justice for all.